The Triassic period, as many of you all have come to know, was a unique time in Earth's history, and as can be seen from my channel, I have already covered a few of these such animals, which lived during the time period, all special and bizarre in their own ways. And there will most definitely be more videos coming out that focus on this time, given how underrated it is. Another such animal is the bizarre Eretmorhippus, animals which have often been compared with platypuses, due to them seemingly possessing an amalgam of different anatomical features, with this comparison being even more relevant later on when it comes to both of these animals. To start, the first remains of Eretmorhippus were discovered in an exposure of the Jiangjian Formation in Hubei, China in 1991, although it was not described until 2015 as Eretmorhippus caroldongi, with a second specimen also being recovered from the same area being known of. The remains date back to the early Triassic, 251 through 247 million years ago with them being attributed to an order of animals known as Hupasuchia, and as a Hupasuchian were closely related to ichthyosaurs, as is evident from shared anatomy also being aquatic. Also being found was that the holotype consisted of the entire skeleton aside from the skull. While of course being quite unique and somewhat reported on, their uniqueness wasn't immediately apparent to those who described and discovered them. This would change, however, three years later, as their recognisability and publicity increased considerably after two more specimens were found at the same location in 2018, with one being almost fully intact and notably included the skull, with the discovery being described in detail in early 2019. This new specimen further emphasised the bizarre characteristics of the species, and even revealed new ones as well, giving a great insight into the experimental forms life took after the Great Dying, barely a few million years before. At around 70 centimetres in length, they were fairly small animals, although their combination of traits more than makes up for it, with them possessing seemingly overbuilt skeletons with densely packed ribs, stiffened trunks, long tails, large paddle-like limbs, as well as very small heads. They also possess bony plates on their backs, with this combination of features making them unlike anything like them before and after their extinction. Eretmore Hippus is unique among Hupasuchians in having manual and pedal digits that radiate out in a fan-like shape, which would have allowed them to be fairly manoeuvrable in water, something that would be key for their lifestyle since their bodies overall were quite rigid, and the same would have been the case on the tails, since the hemal spines span three caudals apiece and are almost all horizontally oriented. Like other Hupasuchians, they also possess three overlapping layers of armor-like osteoderms over their spine, which cap the top of the dorsal vertebrae, and while these are known of in other Hupasuchians, they are considerably smaller, with those of Eritmore Hippus being enormous in comparison, appearing similar to the lateral scoots present on sturgeon, with other researchers also comparing them to stegosaur dorsal plates. These plates have been debated over as to what their purpose was, especially when they are found in an aquatic animal that could reduce their hydrodynamics, although, as we'll get into, this may not have affected them all that much given what their niche may have been. They may have helped protect them from predation or some kind of combat within the species, although, as they were some of the largest animals in their environment known for the moment, this might not be valid. They may have also helped in regulating body temperature as modern reptiles like crocodilians and turtles have been known to use their armour for all of these purposes. Eritmore Hippus also had quite tiny eyes for their size, as when compared to Hupasuchus, a close relative, which did have fairly typical eye size, while they were around the same size, their eyes were half as large, with their skulls also being quite small as well. In the profile, the skull looks similar to that of a toothless crocodile skull without much room for their eyes or nostrils, and in a dorsal view, looks remarkably similar to that of a platypus, which has risen some very interesting discussion on their niche and how they would have functioned anatomically and behaviourally. The similarities aren't just superficial, as just like these unrelated mammals, the upper and lower jaws were comprised of thin bony rods, which would have been surrounded by cartilage. Side by side, there are clear convergences with the modern platypus, such as the small eyes and the aforementioned bill, with the blue space on the platypus skull featured on this diagram, representing the labial cartilage that makes up the soft tissue beak in platypuses, and is also inferred for Eretmorhippus, although not to the same extent. 
platypuses also have a pair of foramen, one in front of each eye, for the ethmodial nerve which provides sensory branches to the nasal cavity, with their its mohippus appearing to have analogous foramen, which is incredibly rare in reptiles and unknown of in other hoopasuchians. There is also a large hole in the bones in the middle of the bill in both animals, with this part of the skull and platypuses being filled with receptors that allows them to hunt by touch in muddy streams or at night. There are differences, however, not just in the form of the bill, as the external nares of platypuses are all the way down at the end of the snout, whereas they are about halfway up the skull in Eretmorhippus. This combination of features is key in understanding how Eretmorhippus functioned and lived, with the combination of small eyes, toothless bill, and stiff body leading researchers to propose that Eretmorhippus filled an unusual role in its ecosystem likely hunting for small invertebrates in murky water while relying on touch. Their eyes, being quite reduced, would have meant they would have had poor sights, with them in fact being the oldest known record of reduced visual capacity in amniotes, with them instead utilising touch and the mechanoreceptors in their bills to detect prey, explaining their stiff bodies as they did not have to be fast, instead focusing on their manoeuvrability, evidenced by the increased flexion in their hip and neck regions, as well as their large paddle-like limbs. This indicates that they may have sifted around in the mud and sand underwater to look for small aquatic prey like invertebrates to feed on. The discovery of Eretz Morhippus reveals that the ecological diversity of marine reptiles was already high in the late early Triassic, and challenges the traditional view that the ecological diversification of marine reptiles was delayed following the end Permian mass extinction, and as a Hoopasuchian, they were all aquatic based on their anatomy. The interesting thing about the group is that they are known only from lower Triassic rocks in China, with the lands that would become this region being a large group of islands surrounded by tropical seas, much like modern Indonesia and all the Philippines. The entire clade that we know of therefore seems to have been restricted to an enormous lagoon spanning about 1,200 kilometres east to west, and about 500 kilometres north to south, all living at the same time and place. Other Hoopasukins also have toothless bills, although they are often long and pointed, resembling herons, swordfish, and their ichthyosaur relatives, which would have allowed for niche partitioning among the different genera with these animals being more similar to lunge feeders in the style of pelicans and baleen whales, with some speculating that Hoopasuchus, at least, may have had soft tissue structures for filter feeding along the premaxillae. They flourished during the early Triassic, although they vanished from the fossil record soon after, and they seem to be a case of rapid diversification after the largest extinction events to occur on the planet, with surviving lineages diversifying at an accelerated pace because they were unconstrained by competition, and may have become extinct as niches became more solid and more derived, and more successful animals outcompeted them in their respective niches. Either way, Eretz Morhippus and other Hoopasuchians were very unique animals, and their diversity goes to show how life can rebound after even the worst catastrophes and adapt into new and ever intriguing forms. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.